of cybersecurity company Kaspersky Lab. He's delivering his speech on the impact of global cybersecurity systems on Australia and the region. Let's take a listen in. And if you see the green box, internet security, uh, that's mine. <laughs> uh, a very good product, by the way. Uh, I use it for many, many, many years. Uh, okay. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk about the major issues in uh, cyber landscape, uh, what happens with uh, security. And uh, I'd like to split in uh, three different categories. First, cyber crime. Second, cyber espionage. And attacks on a critical infrastructure in a cyberspace. Uh, cyber crime, it's huge. Uh, it's very international. There are 10,000 people in this business. Uh, from time to time, we have a very nice reports about arrests in a very different countries. Uh, but the cybercrime, which really damaged the global economy, uh, I think it's, uh, well, it's number three in the top list of the cyber problems. Uh, simply because the cybercrime, they are just uh, genius, oh, well, some stupids uh, and genius at the same time, the stupids are arrested. Uh, <laughs> genius are still in business. But there are more and more stupids are coming to this, uh, to this business. Uh, but uh, technically speaking, we have a good enough technologies and products. I am not talking about my company. The uh, internet security industry, we have good enough technologies and products uh, to protect you from the cybercrime attacks. Plus, if you keep your mind switched on when you browse the internet, well, you're double protected. Uh, plus to that, uh, there are very good news that finally Interpol is opening the cyber division in Singapore. I was talking about Internet Interpol for about 10 years. I said that Internet doesn't have borders. So criminals, they behave like in the same territory, but national cyber police departments, they are disconnected. And it's very difficult to build the relationship. Well, now it's not as bad, but in the beginning, uh, years ago, it was really bad. So national cyber de departments, they were not able to investigate on our other territories. Nations are nations, they're national borders, but the internet is global. And that time I said, uh, to be more successful with the cyber investigations, we must have international body to be responsible to supervise the uh, cyber investigations in the uh, cyberspace. Uh, some people were smiling on me and said, hey, what is this guy is talking about? It's not serious. It's uh, far from reality. Well, I was right. Uh, next year, <laughs> uh, next year, uh, the Interpol is opening the cyber division in Singapore. And actually, we are in this uh, trip, uh, my next stop is in Singapore to announce this partnership and to start to work together. Uh, so I think that uh, the cyber crime, which is huge, it's global, it's, uh, well, it's a dark side economy. Uh, but I think that uh, very soon we'll have uh, much less issues with cyber criminals. Well, don't afraid about my business. Uh, I will stay in it because there, it's not possible to arrest all criminals. Anyway, there will be some stupid guys, well, genius guys, which are not arrested and will be still the damage from cyber crime. Uh, but I hope that it will be not as bad as it is at the moment. Uh, so that's uh, good news. Uh, but I think that cybercrime also is not a big issue here in Canberra uh, because there's, there's government here, embassies. Uh, cybercrime is a problem somewhere in Sydney and Melbourne, far away from you. Uh, the more important, I think, that's uh, cyber espionage. Uh, oh well, once. We were assisting uh, one nation to investigate the uh, cyber incident, and we found two different espionage models in the same computer. So there are two other nations watching the data on one the government computer in a nation in a country which I don't want to to name. It's not Russia, <laughs> <laughs> but that day I said. Well, there are so many espionage attacks that I think that all the data is stolen globally, at least twice. <laughs> well, unfortunately, in the cyberspace, uh, which is not designed with a good enough security and our 
architecture of these networks, or of the software operating systems. Unfortunately, there is a lot of space for espionage, and I don't need to explain that, you know. Uh, unfortunately, there is a very huge problem. And uh, from technical point of view, unfortunately, to protect from espionage attacks is much more complicated and expensive comparing to cybercrime. Cyber criminals, they're looking for random victims. They infect thousands, ten thousands of computers, and they're just looking for the random information. Uh, it's like they're walking along the street. They don't know you, but they, they see the wallet in your pocket, in your back pocket, they will take it. Cyber espionage is different. They know you. They know your computer systems. They know which antivirus product you use to protect the system. So they will attack you until the door is open. Uh, many of these attacks, I'm pretty sure, they have a quite big budgets. Uh, I didn't hear it from Mr. Snowden, by the way. I see from the code. Well, actually, I'm a software company, so I, 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 well, I can't understand how, how, how big budget was behind this particular research and development. Uh, such attacks like Stuxnet, uh, Gauss, Flame, Red October, I'm pretty sure there were millions or maybe $10 million of budget, budget behind these attacks. Uh, by the way, I was really surprised. Why did you mention Snowden? I think I'm in Australia, so I have to mention Assange. <laughs> <laughs> Snowden is a former American citizen, now it's a Russian citizen. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but well. Uh, cyber espionage. Uh, to protect computer system from espionage attacks, we must use extra security technologies and products. Unfortunately, at the moment, there are not many products which can guarantee this extra security. Uh, and don't, well, don't estimate 100% protection. There is no 100% security. And if they really want to hack you, they will do that. The question is, how much money they're going to spend on that? It's the same like with cryptology. It's possible to hack everything. It's possible to break every cryptographic algorithm, but it could be too much expensive. So information in there is less expensive than budget to hack it. So I think the same we have to do to protect our system from the espionage attacks. Uh, the system must be as well protected that the hack must be more expensive than the cost of information. Agree? That, 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 that's just a very basic economy. Uh, so I'm expecting the endpoint plus plus, as I call it, protection uh, on the market very soon, and that's a good news. Actually, there, there are some ideas, the technologies have to make uh, systems almost unhackable. Uh, well, when? We're going to see the systems used by enterprises, by governments. Uh, unfortunately, even if they're ready, that takes time to adapt your IT networks and uh, the systems and to make the IT engineers to change the mind. Uh, but I think it's a, some, it's a question of years. Uh, it's a technical issue. It's a technical part of the problem. Then I'm coming to the political part of this problem. Actually, the espionage in the cyberspace. I'm afraid it's extremely dangerous uh, because it's damaged trust between nations. Well, I don't need to explain. Do you agree? Next, if nations don't trust each other in the cyberspace, the next step is to separate government and enterprise networks from public networks, to use the national internet segment instead of public internet. Two networks, one public network and one enterprise and government network. It's an obvious step and actually it's, I'm not the first man to talk about that. Some nations, they're already they're planning that. It's not Chinese firewall. The Chinese firewall is not a, well, it's, it's not firewall. Uh, it's not a wall. It's a little fence. So it's very easy to step all over that. Uh, I'm talking about the two separate networks. Uh, I'm afraid it's a very bad option. Well, individuals will not recognize that, of course, because they still stay in the public segment. They 
governments and enterprises will be happy because they have a secure, unhackable network. Good news? No. First of all, there will be much less investment into public segment. Governments and enterprises leaving the public space means that the budgets running away. Second, do you have enough of engineers to build Australian national network? <laughs> Wrong answer. Uh, we are working with uh, universities, uh, technical universities everywhere around the globe. And we are really serious about the IT security education programs. And we support universities with our knowledge and expertise. But unfortunately, there were not enough of students in the IT security streams. We don't have enough of IT security experts. So I'm afraid. Well, do you have enough of budget for the national broadband network in Australia? Do you, well, I'm in a hotel. It still doesn't have internet. Well, there is some kind of internet uh, connection. <laughs> but I, I failed to download pictures of my family, which my wife did recently. Is it internet? No. Well, you still don't have internet. Well, that's good. But maybe Australia even don't need to have the connection to the rest of the world. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but well, uh, can you imagine that plus to BNB or NB, National Broadband Network, NBN, plus to NBN, you must invest into the separate computer network, Internet 2.0. Can you imagine that? Well, I'm pretty sure the local IT security, well, local IT companies and software companies, internet companies will be very happy. But what about the national budget? I'm afraid that's a very serious problem. That's why I think that espionage in the cyberspace is a very bad idea. Uh, well, espionage did exist, does exist, and will exist. But I think that in the cyberspace, governments have to talk to each other uh, to agree to make it like a little bit less. Because if, they are not going, if they're not doing that, I'm afraid the scenario is the fragmenta fragmentation of the internet to the national zones, uh, which is a very bad idea. I think so. I, I love internet, so I live in the internet. I want to keep it as it is now. Uh, maybe a little bit more regulation, but not disconnected, uh, not national fragments of the internet. Uh, so that was about espionage. Uh, next is about the worst thing in the cyberspace, attacks on a critical infrastructure. The good news is that we don't have too many such attacks. Cyber criminals, they have all millions of attacks a day. Espionage, maybe hundreds. Attacks on a critical infrastructure, two or three a year. By the way, this year uh, in my list of these attacks, I have just one attack on a financial system in South Korea in April, in March. So in my list of the attacks on a critical infrastructure, uh, which were designed to attack, uh, there were some reports from CIA about attacks on uh, Brazilian power plants. Unfortunately, I don't have any details about that. It was just a very little comment that uh, power plants in Brasilia, they were under their very serious attack. And there was some kind of damage. I don't know which damage. The first story, which I don't have any details about. Second, attack on Estonia. All the country was shut down. Internet out. Well, and you know that internet is not only the Facebook and exchanging emails, even corporate emails. It's also financial services. It's also other businesses which, are, which depend on the internet. Uh, the third attack on Georgia in 2008. Well, attack on Estonia, it was made, well, many people say that it was Russian government behind attack on Estonia. Uh, I don't believe that because we were watching their criminal networks, uh, forums, and we saw how Russian criminals, they were coordinating attack on Estonia. So I'm pretty sure, I'm 99% sure that there were Russian criminals behind the attack on the Estonia. But next year, there was attack on Georgia. The same time, there was a military conflict between Georgia and Russia. Okay. 
I don't know, but... <laughs> it looks like that. It sounds like that. It smells like that. <laughs> it's that. <laughs> uh, next attack, uh, Stuxnet. And uh, in my list, it was only... That's only one attack which caused uh, real physical damage. Uh, then there was a Viper attack on uh, Iran. Uh, their oil companies in Iran, they lost the data, and actually they were losing the data every month on 20, on 21st of the month. Uh, actually, we failed to find the Viper, so we don't have any technical data about this attack. But next was attack on Saudi Arabia. August last year, uh, the company lost data on... A 30,000 computers, servers, backups. So the company was paralyzed. Uh, uh, last uh, last uh, January, there was a Davos Economic Forum, and there was a gas and oil stream, and uh, they were talking about cybersecurity, and they invited me to this meeting, and there was a president of uh, Saudi Aramco. Uh, he agreed that there was a very big damage on the company, and he said that for two weeks the company was not working. And he said, we don't understand how much we do depend on IT until the catastrophe. And the catastrophe is like a body with no oxygen in the blood. So production is in place, so they have oil. Ships are coming, employees are in the office and in the factories, Everything is okay. They lost all the data. They don't. They didn't know. They didn't know what to do with this oil. The company was paralyzed. Uh, next, there was attack on South Korea. Very same attack. Uh, I'm afraid that in the future we will see more and more and more similar scenarios. And I'm afraid to protect the critical infrastructure is much more complicated than to protect their computer systems from the espionage attacks. So the cybercrime is cybercrime. It's, well, big, dangerous, but we know how to handle that. Espionage is more expensive. To protect national critical infrastructure from uh, these types of attacks, it will be even more expensive. Uh, bad news. Uh, what do I mean by critical infrastructure? Everything around you, power plants, power grid, Transportation, healthcare, financial system, international space station. Uh, it's also have SCADA. Do you know SCADA? Do I need to explain what SCADA is? It's a computer system which manages the uh, physical environment. Uh, international space station, they have Linux. Uh, and they, well, they manage the SCADA is on, based on Linux. And uh, the space guys, after some time being there, they even remember the IP addresses of the components of the space station. Do you think that they are the space guys, they do some manual job there to change the configuration? No. That's it. Uh, also, they have the Windows network for the scientists. And scientists, from time to time, they are coming to the space with USBs, which are infected. I'm not kidding. I was talking to Russian space guys. They said, yeah, from time to time, there are virus epidemics in the space station. So these computer networks, they're everywhere around. And unfortunately, they are not safe by design. Unfortunately, it's possible to develop attacks like Stuxnet to damage physical infrastructure. It's possible to develop attacks like Viper or Shamoon, Saudi Aramco attack, to erase data in the critical industries like financial sector, like transportation. Unfortunately, it's possible to design global DDoS attacks against the national segment of Internet. So there are three scenarios. First, attacks on the physical environment. Second, attack on data, critical data. And third, attacks on the telecommunication. Uh, is Australia safe, maybe? Because Australia doesn't have the natural enemies. Except maybe some neighbors. Uh, I didn't say New Zealand. 
Australia is like a far, far away from the rest of the world. I'm wrong, I'm in Australia. So the rest of the world is far, far away from Australia. Uh, but unfortunately, internet doesn't have borders. Uh, and uh, the attacks on uh, very different systems, somewhere far, far away from you in the very hot areas of this world, maybe in the Middle East or somewhere in Pakistan and India, or in Latin America, doesn't matter. They have a very same computer systems. They have a very same operating system, have the same hardware. And uh, for example, power plants. If there is a power plant somewhere far away from you under the attack, and Australia has a very similar power plant, and the attack is a malware, it can spread. If it comes to Australia and infects the network of Australian power plant, I call it collateral damage. Unfortunately, it's very possible that other nations which are not in the conflict will be victims of the cyber attacks on a critical infrastructure. It's a cyberspace, no borders, very same systems. And if uh, industrial environment, uh, the, the utility companies, they have very same projects which they, they are based on, I'm afraid it's very possible that some uh, critical infrastructure will be the victims of the random attacks from the cyber wars very far, far away from you. And unfortunately, at the moment, there is no cure against this threat. Because all these systems, they were designed many years ago, 10 years ago, 20, more. Uh, in the spring in the United States, there was, they published the announcement. They are looking for the assembler programmers for nuclear power plants to support PDP-11 computers. How many people in the room still remember PDP-11? Well, 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 okay, okay, that's not university. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not <laughs> students. Uh, but students, of course, they don't know that. Uh, unfortunately, all these systems, they were designed many years ago, most of them. Uh, and to redesign the system and to make them immune uh, from their attacks on the critical infrastructure, I'm afraid it will be even much more expensive than uh, protection from the espionage attacks. And we will need even more IT security engineers. We will need more software engineers to redesign the software which runs critical infrastructure on a safe platform. Uh, we need to educate IT engineers to redesign the networks, at least to disconnect the unnecessary data from the internet. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, many, uh, many systems which we call critical infrastructure, they are connected to the internet. Uh, do you remember blackout in the United States in 2003? Do you know the reason of this blackout? There was an internet worm, which was infecting com Windows computers, but also as a side effect, it damaged Unix computers. And the system which were managing the East Coast power grid, it used vulnerable Unix machines. Crash. Uh, okay, 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 I don't want to scare you, really. And uh, you have to be, uh, a uh, little bit skeptic about me because I am 25 years in IT security, uh, so I'm paranoid. And paranoia is a professional disease <laughs> of the security people. Uh, so I'm paranoid and uh, when I have an opportunity to talk to people, I'm talking about the worst case scenarios. Uh, it's my job to warn you. It's my job to explain you what's going on. So I'm paranoid, but at the same time, I'm optimistic we will survive. I don't know how, but we will. <laughs> uh, I think that's time. Thank you. Uh, time now for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene.
Nicholas Bursky. Before I go to my colleagues on the floor, though, I might just ask the first question. I cast my mind back to shortly after 9-11 and an address at uh, this press club by the then head of the engineering profession in this country, where he raised real alarms uh, about the threat uh, to critical infrastructure in Australia, uh, how easy it would be to target it. And I have to say, uh, it gained no traction whatsoever with the government at that time. It took about two years before the government picked up on pretty much all of those messages, but it took a long time to come through. I'm just wondering what your perspective is in terms of the understanding at government level. And I'm not talking about the, the key IT professionals uh, and advisors who may be sitting in this room, who are sitting in this room, who advise government, but the politicians themselves, whether they really have uh, a comprehension not just of the threats that exist today, but of the potential threats downstream. Uh, thank you for this question because it's uh, very important. Uh, actually, the governments, they are split in a different category. Well, they are uh, departments in the governments, they are split in different categories. Uh, departments which are responsible for the national security, for national defense, they are scared to death. They don't know what to do. They do understand the scenarios. They do understand that it's possible to shut down power plants, power grids, space station. They don't know what to do. Uh, departments which are responsible for offense, they see it as opportunity. Uh, they don't understand that uh, in a cyberspace, everything you do, it's a boomerang. It will get back to you. Uh, Stuxnet which was, well, I don't know, but if you believe American media, it was written, it was developed by American and Israel uh, secret services, Stuxnet, against Iran, to damage Iranian nuclear pro uh, program. How many computers, how many enterprises were hit by Stuxnet in United States? Do you know? I don't know, but many. Uh, last year, for example, Chevron, they agreed that they were badly infected by Stuxnet. Uh, the friend of mine uh, working in a Russian nuclear power plant once, it, uh, during this uh, Stuxnet time, sent a message that the nuclear plant network, which is disconnected from the internet, uh, in Russia, this all that is We are paranoid. <laughs> So the man sent a message that their internal network is badly infected by Stuxnet. Uh, so unfortunately, these people who are responsible for offensive uh, technologies, they recognize cyber weapons as an opportunity. Well, and the third category of uh, uh, politicians of the government people, they don't care. So there are three types of people. Scared to death, opportunity, don't care. Question now from Michael Brissenden. Uh, hello, uh, Michael Brissenden from ABC. Um, I'm just interested. <laughs> what do you think that they? Sh two questions. What do you think that these people who are scared to death should do? I mean, you say they don't know what to do. What should they do? Uh, well, actually, they don't know what to do. Uh, but I think that first of all, they are very good idea is to, uh, to develop some kind of the national cyber resilience strategy. Uh, and because the cyberspace is exactly the same in all the nations, I think that uh, there, there is no place for national cyber resilience strategy. It must be international cyber resilience strategy. Uh, United States is working on that, uh, Brussels, uh, some other nations as well, and uh, we do our best to share our expertise and uh, to explain our opinion on the cyber resilience on the strategy which we need to follow. And uh, actually this uh, uh, strategy has several blocks, technologies and products. What do we need to protect the critical infrastructure? Uh, second, education and uh, well, awareness of the problem. And third, government regulation and international cooperation against uh, these issues. Uh, but how many years is it <laughs> to develop that? I don't know. It's a long story. And, and the second question is, um, when we talk about cyber crime, people seem to be very preoccupied with China. But it's very clear that uh, Russia, Eastern Europe, uh, North Korea, uh, these are places where a lot of these sorts of cyber attacks are coming from. Where do you think the biggest danger is geographically? Where is the biggest network of people doing this stuff? 
Uh, I think that uh, their main danger is uh, from the Russian-speaking criminals, because they are the most smart guys. <laughs> 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 well, uh, the reality is that uh, Russian technical education system still works very well. Uh, well, my company is very international, so we have our employees and offices everywhere around the globe. Uh, but uh, R&D still is based in Russia, Moscow, St. Petersburg, Novosibirsk, because we are very happy with the quality of Russian engineers. They are the best. Russian, engineer, Russian software engineers are the best. Condoleezza Rice once told me. <laughs> and, uh, it was a panel about the security issues. So she was talking about the, uh, she was talking about the geopolitical uh, problems, and I was talking about cybersecurity problems, about the critical infrastructure, like here. And uh, she turned to me and said, oh, by the way, Russian software engineers are the best. I said, I 200% agree with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Russian software engineers are the best, and Russian software malware engineers are the best. So they are most smart, so the, be the most dangerous are, well, I don't, I don't want to say Russians, Russian speaking. Uh, so they are from Ukraine, from Kazakhstan, from Baltic countries, uh, uh, from Seattle, uh, from Germany, from New York, from Silicon Valley, well, many places. Uh, but the, in, the, in terms of numbers of attacks, Chinese-speaking malware, Chinese-speaking criminals, they are well, more than half of the attacks. Uh, second place, uh, Spanish and Portuguese. Well, we, we can recognize uh, the country of the origin of this particular criminal attack. Uh, in many cases, we can recognize the language. Uh, but in some cases, we can recognize is it Spanish or Portuguese, because there's just some very short comments in the, in the, in the, in the, in the malware. So we don't know is it Spanish or Portuguese, they're so close languages. So number one is China. Number two, well, Chinese-speaking malware. Number two, uh, Spanish-Portuguese-speaking malware. Number three, Russian-speaking malware, but Russian-speaking malware is the most, the most complicated. Question now from Kim Bergman. Uh, Kim Bergman from Asia Pacific Defense Reporter, Privia. Um, uh, I'd like to go back to Stuxnet, and I actually think that uh, officials in the US have confirmed that they have been involved in that. Uh, how frequently do you find that governments are involved in cyber espionage and issues of cyber security? Uh, that's a good question because uh, uh, I'm afraid in most of cases we can't recognize is it espionage or criminal attack. Uh, I think that in many cases we intercept the attack, we see that this piece of malware is uh, looking for some information in the computer, but we don't know which kind of information was stolen. If there was a financial information, that could be cyber criminals. If they're confidential data, classified data could be espionage. But in most of cases, we don't see the, this difference. But sometimes, if we see the attacks like uh, Red October, uh, Gauss, Flame, that's definitely nations behind that because it, they have a very huge budget behind these attacks. Cyber criminals, they don't need to invest millions of dollars to attack their victims. It's much less expensive, thousands. So there is a difference, and there is a very big distance from the typical criminal attack and a high-complexity espionage attack. So we can see these attacks. Uh, so technically speaking, uh, we don't see American attacks, but they do exist. We don't see Russian attacks, but I'm pretty sure, I'm 99.99% .99 sure that we intercept them. I don't see Australian attacks. Maybe you license them from the United States. <laughs> uh, we see many Chinese attacks. They don't care. <laughs> no, really? So they, it's an espionage attack with the simplified Chinese commands in it. With a hosted service, hosting service in some provinces of China. Uh, with all their executable files compiled during the work time in China, <laughs> in these time zones. 
Well, recently we managed to find the Facebook, well, that's not Facebook, of course, there's a social media, Chinese social media page with the images of these guys who were developing the, the attack. <laughs> yes, they don't care. The Chinese, they don't care. <laughs> uh, well, by the way, uh, still, I don't know who is behind these Chinese attacks. Maybe governments or maybe independent hackers which are employed by government. Or I've heard, okay, it's not my data, I've just heard the rumors, uh, that there are many independent hackers uh, in China which developed these espionage attacks. They steal the data, and then this data is being sold on the black market in China. And Chinese enterprises and government, they are customers. So it's like a free market. <laughs> well, I don't know, that could be true. Maybe all that is true. Some attacks, they are sponsored directly by government. Some of them, they're independent. Question from Julian. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, so sorry. Uh, uh, then, <laughs> there are many arrests in China. There are many criminals arrested in China. And they disappear. Maybe they are employed. I don't know. I don't know. They just, <laughs> why not? Well, uh, the traditional criminals and cyber criminals, they're different. Traditional criminals, they're stupid or genius stupid people. You know, you know this type of people. Uh, is it uh, Western Sydney? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so this type of people, uh, computer criminals, they're absolutely different. They're geeks. They're geeks which are with broken minds. So computer criminals, they cooperate with police when they see police. Police knocks the door, open the door, and cyber criminals, they start to cooperate in most of cases. So I guess that when cyber criminals, Chinese cyber criminals are arrested, they start to cooperate. Uh, maybe Russians as well. There are many arrests in Russia. OK. <laughs> Question from Julian Bukowski. Oh, yes, greetings from Western Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember correctly, the Russian tractor factory used to be in Auburn. Um, <laughs> but um, great vodka from there, too. Um, my question goes to the banking system and the financial services system, where the technology there more or less started out in the 70s, perhaps even the 60s, and um, even the numbers, credit card numbers and those sorts of numbers, the technology around that, the standards haven't really jumped a whole lot in terms of their their construction and, and their security. My question is really, in the financial services sector, how much does the industry have itself to blame for the levels of cybercrime and, and do they need to be held accountable to a degree to actually sharpen up their infrastructure so that these, uh, these people helping themselves to our wallets are, um, you know, find it a lot harder? Good question. Uh, I'm afraid, that give me time. Next time in Australia, I'm not ready to transfer it. It's a good question because well, I'm not uh, the expert in financial, all this financial stuff. I'm expert in uh, uh, malicious code. Um, let me think about that. I will call you back. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, actually, I'd like to have such presentation and questions, but from time to time, the questions, they, they make me to think about the, the right answers. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, fine. Um, I think the next question is to Brendan Nicholson. Then we'll go to, uh, I think it's uh, Graham Phillipson at the end of the table there. Brendan Nicholson. I'm very glad the Chinese work nine to five. Um, there's been, you'd be aware there's a comprehensive debate underway in Australia at the moment uh, related to our NBN system and whether the, uh, the Chinese giant Huawei should actually be allowed to run significant parts of this. Now, some former ministers are on the board of the Chinese company are assuring us that it's perfectly safe and, and there's no danger. There's been research done in the United States, uh, sorry, the United Kingdom, where they've decided that there's a strong view that it's not a problem for British security. Uh, if you're in charge of national security in Australia, 
would you allow a major Chinese company to have access, that sort of access, to our major communication system? Uh, the IT security and actually their IT business now is a business of trust. Uh, so to be uh, the uh, supplier of uh, national projects, uh, I think it's uh, also a question of trust. Uh, to have uh, the enterprise customers and government customers, it's also a question of trust. Um, if you don't trust a company, uh, you'll never be a customer of that company. If it's about security, I didn't say IT security, any kind of security. If it's IT and if it's bank services and healthcare, that's it. Uh, do you trust Coca-Cola? You don't care. You just drink it. You trust quality, but not the company. So it's a different kind of business. So the businesses are split in two different categories. Business which are based on trust and businesses which I don't really need to be trusted. And IT business and IT security and all kind of security is a business of trust. So only companies which are trusted, they can be suppliers of the national projects. Uh, in my case, actually, of course, I have many questions about, hey, you're a Russian spy? <laughs> what about your past? <laughs> what about your lucky? Ah, there are so many friends in Russia. Uh, actually, to prove that uh, you can trust us, well, actually, we, we had so many questions in the United States. Well, actually, not, not many questions like this in Europe. In the United States, uh, we are slowly approaching the United States uh, enterprise and government contracts. And, of course, we had many questions. And I said, okay, so what we're do, going to do? We will open the office in D.C. area. We will send our source code of our products to this area. We will employ United States citizens non-Russian United States citizens to compile our products on the territory of the United States. Is it okay for you? If you want to check our source code, our technologies, you're welcome. I asked this question in the Hill. They said, that's okay. That's perfect. So now we're opening the office in D.C. for this reason. So I think that the companies, software companies and hardware companies, if they want to get uh, their government or national contracts, they must open the doors by request and show all the insights by requests. Uh, actually, I do. And, well, thanks to what this policy, uh, last year we opened the door, we're a Russian company, but we opened the door to NATO contracts in Europe. So a couple of... Uh, countries in Europe, NATO countries, the, the armies of these companies, uh, of these countries, they are our customers. So we can prove that they can trust us. Uh, once again, that's a question of trust. If you want to be the supplier of these contracts, you must uh, be a trustful source of their technologies and products. Well, if I were, how many journalists are here in the room? <laughs> <coughs> if I were CEO of, CEO of Huawei, I would open the technologies. Just sign the NDA or maybe on the government level, just to have extra guarantees and just to present that there is no backdoors in the, in the, in the products. Question. Yes, it's obvious. If you don't trust, you're not a customer. Security, IT, banks, healthcare, what else? Press club. Hmm? Press club. Press club. <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, Graham Phillipson. <laughs> Graham Phillipson, IT Wire. Uh, one of the questions uh, or issues to come out of the Ed Snowden revelations is that uh, the NSA or other uh, uh, security bodies in the US have been leaning on security companies and encryption companies to weaken their products to make it easier for governments to, to snoop on them. Have you had any experience of this and uh, what's your, your, your views on that, uh, those actions? Uh, not really because uh, I was lucky to be proactive. 
so I said that we will detect any kind of the malware which we have in our hands. Uh, there is no question about the origin. Is it government or state-sponsored state or criminal? Doesn't matter. And actually, we do. Uh, we never had such a request. Not to, well, actually, we're not internet company, so we don't really need to have a backdoors in our product because, well, actually, it's more easy. It's, more, it's cheaper to inject the backdoor without the product. Uh, uh, the question is about to detect or not to detect government malware. No question, we will do that, and it doesn't matter which kind of malware is it. Uh, from time to time, my engineers, they are scared. Uh, from time to time, they come to me and, well, they won't, in these such cases like Gauss, Flame, Red October, they're coming to me and they say, hey, Eugene, we got uh, another rabbit from the hole. We want to put it back. We can't. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Is it rabbit? Yes. Detected. <laughs> I don't know how many uh, espionage attacks or well, state-sponsored attacks we detect, uh, which uh, originated in the United States, in Israel, in Russia, other nations. We don't know. But we do that. Joanna Heath. Joanna Heath from the Financial Review. Just another question on the NSA and uh, Edward Snowden. How much do you think, um, or how far do you think Edward Snowden has gone in terms of revealing the full extent of what goes on and what the NSA has done in terms of, I or do you think there's more to come? I don't know, I don't know. Well, actually, I am not in touch with Mr. Snowden. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that uh, the major effect of Mr. Snowden is uh, the fact that uh, Mr. Assange is no more important. <laughs> <laughs> Lyndall Curtis. Lyndall Curtis from ABC News 24. Just following on from Graham's question, given how much uh, consumers rely not only on internet security companies to protect them, but also how much people store data in the cloud now, how, how, do, how can consumers trust those companies not to cooperate if they're asked with governments to give them access to the information? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, about the uh, security of the data. Uh, actually, if you store your data on your own computer, on your own device, you are responsible for security. If you store the data in the cloud, you are responsible for your part of the data and the company which provides the cloud service is responsible for safety and security of your data in the cloud. Second, uh, about their uh, access to their personal data in the cloud. Very good question. Actually, when, when I was thinking about that, uh, I don't know what, sh what is worse. Uh, NSA, if we trust Snowden data, uh, NSA was watching the billion people in the internet or were able, of course, the NSA doesn't have resources to watch everyone. Um, in this case, half of population must be NSA officers or 100% of population must be NSA officers. So every first day, the first half is watching the second half, the next day, the second half is watching the first. Uh, actually, they don't have such resources. How bad is it? Uh, how many terrorist attacks the United States had after September 11th? One. So, what is worse? Watching one billion people is very bad. But terrorist attacks on the other side. I don't know which is worse. So it's a very good question about the, this, uh, I don't, I don't want to name an espionage. Espionage is different. Uh, but filtering the personal data uh, for the criminal investigations, for anti-terrorist operations, I don't know. How much they do, I don't know. I'm not a judge. Uh, but I think it's a very temporary question, actually. The next generation kids, which are digital natives, they don't care. They publish all the data. They don't care about privacy. They're in the internet. So I think that these Snowden issues are important only for our generation. The next generation, they will know there is no space 
for Mr. Snowden in the next generation because they will, they don't care. Uh, that's it. Peter Phillips. Do you have kids? So you know that they, they're crazy about the cyber. Uh, I have a very well, it's not about security. I have a very funny story. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about Snowden. Uh, the story was told me about years ago about uh, our French partner. Uh, he said he saw the uh, little girl, five years old girl, uh, in, in a room, and uh, there was a tree uh, in the street, and there was a bird in the tree. So this little girl came to the window to see the, the bird, but it was quite far away. So the girl started to zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so the new generation, they live in the cyber. And I'm absolutely sure that the new generation will accept many things in cyber which we don't. And they will behave in a different way. Uh, this is one more point because I don't know about is it good or bad. So we will see. In, in 20 years, we will see. Peter. Uh, Mr. Kaspersky, Peter Phillip, one of the directors of the National Press Club. Uh, again, welcome and thank you very much for the interesting address. Uh, in the address, you mentioned uh, the, uh, in, in quite a scathing way the attitudes of governments, so, uh, of education systems towards training increasing numbers or adequate numbers of computer engineers, computer technicians, computer technologists. Uh, were you speaking specifically about Australia or was that broadly across the total Kaspersky lab market base or, or, or market constituency? And why is this the case? Why, if governments, if education systems within governments are as aware of the problem as they should be, why are they being so remiss? Why are they so blind to it? Are they abdicating to firms like Kaspersky Lab? Or what, what's your impression about why they're being so blind about this? Uh, I just said why we're talking about our market and education. What's in common? What, why, why is it that governments, uh, in your experience, are, are being so blind to the need to have their education systems train more computer technologists? Uh, and computer it, it, it's simply because it's a very big surprise, because the, no one was expecting that the cyber technologists, uh, the result of these innovations, uh, there is a cyber crime, espionage, and attacks on critical infrastructure. No one expected that. When these computer systems were developed, uh, there was no need for such a security in the product. So there was no need for so many engineers. So it's a very big surprise. And unfortunately, governments and education system, they are, it's, it's very bureaucratic. You know. Yes? Is Australian government bureaucratic? Or is Australian government behaving like an internet company, a startup company? It's bureaucratic, so that takes time, it takes years to make a decision. Then you need to start a new stream or invest more into existing technology streams in the university. Then you need to find the professors, teachers. Then you need to find students. Well, actually, I know that some universities, they already started to invest more into the IT security education. But still, it takes time. Roger Hausman. Roger Hausman for Inside Canberra. It's uh, very pleasant to see that uh, after six or so, seven years visiting Australia, mainly the Gold Coast, I believe, oh, yeah. I went into Canberra. Gold no. Coast is my favorite place. <laughs> well, actually, uh, thank you, Australia, for having the Our Third Conference in Gold Coast. <laughs> now, in terms of uh, your international profile, where do you think that uh, the future will be, for example, for IPv6 addresses? that could be given to everybody that gets born, given that we have RFID and other technologies that may uh, become more common? Uh, well, actually, I, IPv6, well, actually, I'm an IT security boy. Sure. Uh, so I'm talking about IT security only. Well, actually, I, I know only this song. <laughs> uh, so IPv6 is actually, it's almost no difference from a security point of view. It doesn't matter, it's uh, the same. Um, many years ago, I was asked uh, about the IT security uh, change uh, because of Wi-Fi. So there is a cable connection and Wi-Fi connection. They was asked, what's, how Wi-Fi will change the IT security landscape? I said, not much. So IPv6 from a security point of view is just another protocol. It's a little bit more secure, but... but 
unique identifier as uh, IPv6? I don't think I don't think so. Uh, well, maybe in some in couple of generations everybody will have the unique ID, uh, but I don't think it's uh, IPv6. It will be some more smart technology, I think, which you can read remotely, like uh, this, the chip injected in your thief. <laughs> and when you smile, you're connected. <laughs> <laughs> you close the mouth, you're disconnected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking connected now, Roger. Um, I'll, go, I'll, I'll, go back to, I'll go back now to Michael Brissenden. Uh, I just have one more question on Huawei. Uh, it's a bit different as a company. Who are they? <laughs> <laughs> A bit different as a company from yours. I mean, one of the concerns about that company is its connections to the Chinese government. The U.S. Congress has already warned uh, and, and said that they don't want the don't want Huawei as part of their uh, network. That was based on intelligence, much like the Australian decision. And in fact, as I understand it, the Australian and the American intelligence communities work very closely in making a decision, coming to that decision about Huawei. Even if the company does open up, as you say, and shows everybody everything, could you trust them? Mm. I'm not really comfortable to comment uh, the news uh, from the newspapers and from media. Actually, that's, it's not my job to comment that. My job is to protect the uh, endpoints and networks and comment on the cyber security, but not on this. I'm not comfortable talking about Well, when we have a beer late, late, late night, maybe we will talk about that. But well, actually that's, now, I'm talk, now I'm speaking uh, as a CEO of the company. Late at night, I will speak as a Eugene Kaspersky. So as a Eugene Kaspersky, I can speak about that. As a CEO, I can't. I'm sorry. Let me look, uh, let me wrap it up now. Just a, a very general question. You have, uh, and one can understand why, given the comments you've been making today, but it might well be worth at least exploring to conclude. You, you have, as I understand it, expressed uh, you know, quite cons a lot of concern about uh, social media, about Facebook and the the potential for its misuse. Uh, let me just share those thoughts with us because while it might be an issue that everyone in this room is well aware of, I suspect many of our audience uh, members viewing might not be. Uh, sorry. Well, <laughs> Say it again, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> no, well, I've, I've certainly read that you have expressed concern about the dangers of social media and, yes, yes. and Facebook. So uh, the rationale behind your concerns. Uh, well, actually, there three things in uh, social media. First of all, uh, that the cyber criminals use uh, social media to spread the malware and to find victims. Uh, not just uh, the uh, cyber criminals, but also the traditional criminals. Uh, second issue that uh, their secret services, they are watching the data in the social media. Um, to me, it's not a big thing because well, if you publish something in the internet, you make it free. So it, it's like a publishing any data in, in newspapers. So that forget about that. If you publish anything in the social media, it's absolutely 100% public. So aware that not only your friends, but your enemies will be watching the data. And uh, third, uh, user behavior in social media. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that, well, especially in the new generation, the cyber, uh, cyber natives, digital natives, they don't care, they publish too much. And I think that it's kind of, it should be kind of education that we have to be aware of the data we publish in there. And one more issue with uh, social media is uh, that I'm afraid that social media from time to time are used uh, as a political, for political manipulations. Especially in the countries uh, which take uh, social media in a very serious way. Uh, which are addicted to social media. Uh, the countries like uh, in uh, uh, Arab countries in the uh, Mediterranean, uh, Russia, well, in Russian-speaking countries, uh, maybe some other nations as well. I'm not sure about Australia. Is a social media their important tool for political manipulation? Increasingly. Yes? Yes. Increasingly. Mm. So this is one more issue with social media. I don't know what to do with that. Uh, maybe it's a good idea just to have some kind of regulation that the nations, they can't do that. And if they recognize that something wrong is going on in social media, they have to copyright to find people who are using social media to manipulate people. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Uh, thank you so much for your, your listening to such attention. I did my best to scare you with all these <laughs> stories. Uh, I'm sorry that I failed to uh, answer some questions, but well, actually, please understand me. And later we will talk about your question as well. Uh, and thank you so much for speaking English, not Australian. <laughs> <laughs>